Well, it's time for us to uh, begin at 7 o'clock. It's sure good to see all of you tonight. I want to set my little timer here so I won't run over. For, well, people will be coming in, so <laughs> try not to get stuck in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> all right, before we uh, enter into our study tonight on the book of Matthew, we want to begin with a word of prayer. We'll ask Brother Billy Locke to direct our minds. Uh, we've been studying in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, of course Jesus is setting forth in this sermon uh, basic principles for his kingdom. He addresses, uh, there's a multitude there that are listening, but uh, he addresses most of what he says. He's speaking especially to disciples and how they need to conduct themselves and what principles we ought to operate on. Sort of the more immediate context in the sermon, he talked about there being two ways the broad way that leads to destruction and the narrow way and the narrow gate that leads to life. And we need to make sure that we get on that path. Then he talked about false prophets that we talked about last week. And uh, you know them by their fruits. And that's the way to recognize a false prophet. You look at what is the fruit? What's the teaching in comparison to what, what God's word has to say? And what is their life, their influence uh, like? And you can recognize... Uh, the false prophet. And these two different ways, he comes down then to talk about the consequences of not knowing the truth and practicing the truth. And then he gives an illustration of a wise builder and a foolish builder. It's based upon whether you listen to what Jesus says and acts, acts on that, or if you're foolish, you just listen to the lesson and you don't make any changes, you don't obey. And you'll be rejected in the end. And then you have the reaction, overall reaction that the multitude had to the things that Jesus was teaching and the way that he taught here in chapter, uh, end of chapter 7. So verse 21, this is a verse, of course, it's in many, many sermons that are preached. Um, I don't know how many hundred of times I've read it in a sermon. So it's a good section to study in detail and to think about what the verses mean and uh, they're obviously powerful verses to teach other people about how important it is to do God's will and to practice the things that God has revealed in His Word. Because there's lots of people that have religion, even have a form of Christianity, but they're not practicing what the Bible reveals. They're practicing human tradition, their own think so, <laughs> instead of what the Lord has actually revealed for us to do. And Jesus says, you'll be rejected if you're not practicing what is right, if you're not practicing what the law says. In 21, um, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But, <coughs> excuse me. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So a lot of people will say, Lord, Lord, on judgment day. And uh, you can just imagine when you come before the throne and every knee bows and you're going to give account for what you've done, how many people are going to be saying, Lord, Lord. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of appeals made to the Lord. So we mentioned kind of at the end of class last time when you see a, a word doubled, that was one of the ways the Hebrews used to really put emphasis on a word or to show your deep earnestness that you have. So you'll see things like uh, truly, truly, right? <laughs> you know, this is really, really true. You really better pay attention or Abraham, Abraham, to get his attention before he was going to slay his son. And uh, Lord, Lord is what the way people are going to emphasize the Lord Jesus Christ's name on that last day. But just calling him Lord isn't enough. It's not going to save you just because you say Lord, Lord. Uh, in this life or on judgment day, there's got to be more than just those words. Um, a lot of people think about these words as kind of a, a type of prayer that... Uh, you pray to the Lord. A lot of people put a lot of power on saying the sinner's prayer and talking, Lord, Lord, I'm going to receive you into my heart and all of that. But Jesus says you've got to do the will of the Father. It's not just enough to say, Lord, Lord. Right? That's not enough. We ought to be able to see that clearly in his teaching here, that just, just calling on him in prayer is not enough, that we need to uh, repent and obey and Prayer is not enough to save us by itself. And the word Lord has no power to save you if you don't uh, back up your confession that he's the Lord 
by doing the things that he commands. He says you have to, but he says what the, their mistake was, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So how is it we know the will of God? You know, you got to do the will of God. How do, how do we know what the will of God is? Anybody got an answer on that? Somebody says, what's God's will? <laughs> you know, who could know the will of God? You know, by his word, right? It's been revealed. He's made his mind known. His decision, you know, your will is your decisions, your choices that you've made, the commands you've offered if you're in charge. What's the will of God? Well, it's what he's revealed. So if you're not doing the things he's revealed in his word, then you're going to be rejected. Lord, Lord, isn't enough. Um, then he said in this context that you've got to obey. And uh, there are few that obey, right? So there, there, there's few that enter by the narrow way. So we need to make all effort to make sure we're among that few that do the Lord's will and try to convince everybody we love and that's in the world to do that. If you're going to follow Jesus and be saved, you need to do the Lord's will as it's been revealed. And uh, as was mentioned, as we study, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, as Ephesians 5, 17. Um, you know, you want to handle accurately the word of truth so that you don't, uh, you, you can be a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So, we got to study to know what that word says, what the will of God is, so that we can practice it. And uh, we got to bear fruit. The, the good tree bears good fruit. Jesus said, a vine or a branch that's in me, if it doesn't bear fruit, it gets cut off and thrown into the fire, right? <laughs> so we got to be among that, those branches that bear fruit. So abide in Christ, obey, bear the fruit, and... Uh, some people would say, well, it sounds like you're like, we're, we're earning our way to heaven. You're, you're emphasizing work. We're saved by grace through faith. Well, that's right. We're saved by grace of God. Without that grace, everything God has done for us and giving us the plan and sending Christ and him dying for us, we'd, none of us have a chance. We are saved by grace. But the faith has got to act, right? That's the thing. We're saved by grace through faith that strives to enter by the narrow gate, that does the Father's will. We're striving every day to do it. When we fall short, we pray for forgiveness. So we are being saved by grace. But Jesus shows your faith has got to act. It's got, you've got to be trying to do what the Father says. That's what's expected of us. So we try as best as possible to obey him perfectly every day. And when we fall short, we've got our advocate we can go to and ask for forgiveness and start out, try to do better tomorrow, right? So we are saved by grace. We're not, we're not perfect. But he says you need to be striving to do the will of God. And a lot of people uh, from the very beginning of the church, there have been those that don't think it's important how you behave. Oh, I believe. Lord, Lord. But you've got to practice what the Lord says. Verse 20, 22, anybody else have a thought on 21 you want to add? It says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Can you see this person before the judgment seat? And they say, oh, Lord, Lord, I worked for you. I did all of these mighty things for you, right? I did a lot of this good stuff. How many people are going to try to make that kind of appeal on Judgment Day? And he's going to say, yeah, but you didn't do what I commanded you to do. You didn't follow me the way I told you to follow me. Yeah, you did some things. You did some things, even some miracles is the way it describes it there. Uh, but So there's a lot of hypocrites. They're, they're, uh, you know, they make a show of Christianity. They make a show of following Jesus, but... They don't follow him in a way he accepts. He doesn't accept it. He's going to say in the next verse, they're going to be told, depart. Right? I don't know you, is <laughs> what the Lord's going to say. Because obviously they haven't been 
obeying the Lord. They profess to be Christians, but they don't do what the New Testament says to do. They don't worship like the New Testament says. Maybe they didn't obey the gospel like the Bible says. They're not doing the work of the church the way the Lord said to do it. He's the head of the church. So they've been practicing lawlessness. They need to examine all of us. We need to examine our motives because we don't want to be surprised on judgment day and have the Lord say to us, depart. I don't know who you are. You didn't do what I told you to do for the right reasons I told you to do them. So we've been told we need to be seeking right the honor of God. We don't practice our religion to be seen by men, but just be pleasing to God. And we need to do things his way. So a lot of people are going to give high praise to themselves and maybe some other people will praise them there on judgment day. But they're not going to prove acceptable to God. And he's the perfect judge, Jesus Christ. He knows what's in your heart, what you did. He knows all the word of God and all the opportunities you had to study it and know what you're supposed to do and you didn't do it. He knows that. So even miracle workers can be lost. I'll list a few there. <laughs> Didn't we do miracles? Do you think Judas could say that? <laughs> he was one of the apostles, right? He did miracles, but he got rejected, didn't he, on the last? He's the son of perdition, of destruction. He's, that's where he's going. He lost his place. Uh, Balaam, he was a prophet in the Old Testament, but he wanted that money, and he tried to curse God's people, even though God told him not to speak anything but what God said to speak. Um, he was rejected, put to death. And Paul said, even after I have preached to others, I myself might be disqualified, right? I might be reprobate. So if Paul could fall away and he, he'd done all of those miracles, any of us could fall away, right? We have a free will. We had a free will to believe in Jesus and be baptized. And we've got a free will the rest of our life, as long as we're here in this world, right? That we can choose to backslide. So the free will doesn't go away. We need to use it to stay in Christ and make sure that we don't uh, come up short on the last day. So there's a number of false teachers. It says many there at the beginning of that verse, doesn't it? He said on the narrow way it's few, but he said there are going to be a many religious people saying, Lord, Lord, on judgment day, and he's going to reject them. That's, a, that's I don't know, that gets my attention. Does it get yours? <laughs> We better make sure we handle our business right, right? Because we're going to stand before the Lord someday. And there won't be any fooling Him. So you can't just pass by and say, oh, it's, we're just, you know, they just changed a little here and a little there. I'm afraid to change it just a little bit here and there. I don't want to get rejected on that last day. We want to make sure we do, it, do it, what we got authority to do, right? And the things that the Lord has authorized. So be zealous for good works and do what the Lord commands and then we seek that forgiveness every day that we need and uh, walk humbly with God. Verse 23 says, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So he's going to speak out very boldly on judgment day. Very going to declare, confess um, openly that... Uh, I never knew you. Even though you say you did these miracles and you call me Lord, I never knew you. You practiced lawlessness. You didn't do what the law said to do that was delivered by God for a Christian to do. You didn't do those things. Uh, I never knew you. Some have taken that verse and they try to say, and uh, like in Calvinism, you know, you hear about anybody that falls away, they say, well, they never did really believe. Right? <laughs> they never were saved. Because you're once saved, always saved. So if anybody falls away, the Lord, you know, never knew them anyway. They just, everybody thought they were Christians, but they weren't. But we know in the New Testament, there's people like Simon the sorcerer. He was, he believed, he was baptized, but then his heart got caught up in trying to buy those gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> And his heart was not right with God and he needed to repent or he was going to be lost, right? So we know Christians do sometimes believe and they fall back into sin. Uh, this, this, this statement, I never knew you, 
is said to be one of these Semitic idioms. You know, an idiom is uh, where the words don't mean exactly what you, what you literally read, but they're a figure of speech like, uh, let's say somebody's translating English into some other language, and it says, man, I really missed the boat. They go, well, where's the boat? <laughs> right? I don't see the boat. There's no, there's no boat in this story, you know, but he said, I missed the boat. Well, we know what that means. It's part of English idiom. You know, I miss my opportunity, right? That's what miss the boat means. Doesn't have anything to do with an actual boat, really. <laughs> well, I, I never knew you is kind of the same kind of thing. We find it in Jewish writings where somebody's getting excommunicated from their family or getting kicked out of the synagogue, and you say, I never knew you is what they would say to them. Doesn't mean they didn't really ever know them, but I, I, you're rebellious, I reject you, I don't have any relationship with you is the idea. So in judgment say, he's going to say, I never knew you. And uh, you look at some other places where you have similar expressions in Matthew where uh, Peter's denying the Lord. Remember, he says, I don't know the man. (laughs) He even cursed and said, I don't know him. Well, he knew Jesus, but he was repudiating any connection with him, right, when he said that. And when the they're having the wedding feast and they come, you know, too late with their lamps <laughs> and says, I don't know you, right? Same kind of expression. Well, he probably knew them, but I don't recognize and approve of you to let you into this <laughs> wedding feast, right? So um, the expression, here's the way it is recorded in the book of Luke, the same statement in chapter 13 and verse 27. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. So that's another way. I don't know where you're from. You're not, you're not getting in to heaven because you, you it says, depart from me, all you evildoers. When you don't do what the word of God says, you, don't, uh, you show contempt for the law. Um, the Lord's not going to recognize you on judgment day. So we need to do what he says. Make sure that we're doing it because he's going to say, depart And that's go into punishment, go to hell, right? That's what that depart is. If you're not getting into heaven, where are you going? I'll say depart. So these people look pretty successful in life, maybe in whatever church they were worshiping in and wearing Jesus' name. Maybe they they were a choir leader or a piano player or whatever, whatever it might be, preacher, but they weren't preaching what Jesus said to preach. They were preaching a lot of their own doctrine. It's going to be pretty sad, isn't it, to get there on the last day and find out, depart, I don't know who you are. You don't belong to me. So we can have a lot of misconceptions about ourselves. Isn't about the easiest person to fool yourself? Something all of, a lot of us, we fool ourselves on a lot of things. So this, this whole section should make all of us think, I need to be checking and examining myself, like Paul said, to make sure I'm in the faith. Check what I'm practicing with what the Word of God has to say and uh, make sure that I'm doing what the Lord commanded me to do. So a lot of of religious works that people think are really good things they're doing actually undermine what Jesus said to do. You know, if we spend all of our time doing what a lot of churches do, uh, you know, like servicing the whole man and we're all into social justice and we're into uh, you know running hospitals or whatever we're not doing the gospel right (laughs) we're not doing what our main job is which is to teach the word of God and to try to reach lost souls so a lot of things men substitute it just takes the place of what God wants us to do and we have to be on guard against falling into these traps. A lot of people in the past generations have, we've seen it happen. So you add to, you take away from the commandments, you don't obey, you don't get on the narrow way, you don't bear the fruit the Lord wants. He's going to say, depart. I don't know you. All right, verse 24. He he comes to his conclusion of the sermon with uh, a story about a wise and a foolish builder to illustrate the way you better listen to this sermon and everything else Jesus teaches. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
So if you want to be somebody that is very prudent and wise when it comes to your soul, you listen to what Jesus says. That's the first thing you've got to do. But just listening and going out the door and not doing anything about it, it's not any good. It's just like James said, you look at your face in the mirror and you see what you, gotta, you need to change and then you just go away and don't change. That won't bless you. You've got to do what the word says. And so you're like the wise man, he says, who uh, builds his house on the rock. So the wise man, he uh, does the extra work necessary to put a, build a good foundation. He's far-sighted. He recognizes, if I just build this house the fast way that I think saved me the most work right now, <laughs> it won't be ready for testing and judgment that might come in the future. So if you're going to say, I'm a Christian, you need to bear in mind there's going to be evil days come that you better be prepared for. You better be doing the work to get ready for the days when several people you love may die. You know, uh, there'll be some trouble in the church where somebody is teaching false doctrine and there's some kind of squabble and division. Is your faith going to hold when that happens? Are you going to stay faithful? Something happens with one of your children. You know, there's so many different things you don't think of right now. You better build a foundation for your confession. I believe in Jesus. That's going to stand up on Judgment Day and in all these other trials and troubles that we're going to run into in life. So the wise builder, he digs down deep until he gets the solid rock to build his house on. That, that's the picture that's being made. He does that extra work to get that uh, strong foundation on bedrock. And... You listen to when it's recorded in the book of Luke, on a, or maybe on another occasion, Jesus is teaching the same thing. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on the, upon them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when a flood rose and the torrent burst against that house, it could not shake it because it had been, built, it had been well built. So there's going to be testing that's going to come. There's going to be the day of judgment come. And that's the day you've got to do the work for to get ready. That's the reason, you know, nothing's going on maybe right this minute, but it's good to be in this Bible class, be to be studying the Sermon on the Mount and be putting these things away in your mind because next week it might not be that way. Next week you might be in the right in the big middle of something, you know, that you're going to have to hold in there with your faith. Verse 25, and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded upon the rock. So the rain fell down and the floods, the streams, the torrents rose up and they came, overflowed the land where you didn't think it was going to come. And there's a lot of people didn't think, I didn't ever thought that river would get up this high, right? <laughs> I never thought this part of town would flood, but sometimes it happens. You have that hundred year flood or whatever. Now, if you don't have a foundation, you're in big trouble. It slams against the house. I thought that was interesting. I was reading the Greek dictionary there. One of the words, it's like lunge at. And you think about those waves, boom, hitting up against that house or leaning into that house, the wind and the waves hitting it. It is like lunging into your house. And is it going to knock the house down? It's your confession. I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. That's your house. Is it going to stand when the, when the storm hits? It says it was founded in the past on a foundation. It was grounded. It was established upon the rock. A rock there. It's just like that name, upon this rock, I will build my church. It's the same word. And it's that ledge or cleft. It's a massive rock. Not just a little stone, but... You know, you've got down to bedrock and you put your foundation in and now it can stand. Uh, a lot of you guys are, are builders and know a whole lot more about building and foundations than I know anything about. But I understand the verse is <laughs> you better dig deep and, and have a foundation if you want it to test, stand the test. I, I see a lot of these videos, videos on YouTube in floods and you see houses just going down the river. <laughs> Uh, you know, evidently they weren't built in the right spot or, or on the right rock uh, to be able to stand. So then he talks about the foolish builder. That man's house stood. It did not get shaken. 
That's, that's the man I want to be. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell. And great was its fall. So the short-sighted fella, he just builds in a nice easy location. Didn't want to put all that extra work in and expense to really dig down and go to that trouble of getting a good foundation for his house. And as a result, when the day of testing comes, the flood comes, his foundation gives way. It says in the book of Luke, he had no foundation at all, is the point. He didn't build a foundation. In Luke 6 and verse 49, it says, But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house upon the ground without any foundation, and the torrents burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. Very violent when that house caved in. A lot of emotions when you see the, your house going, <laughs> crashing down. Imagine that. Great was its fall. So I can't think of anything greater than standing there on Judgment Day and the Lord saying, I don't know you, depart. You can't get a bigger fall than that, can you? And the way to avoid that is to build a foundation now. So Now for those of you that are watching this uh, class online, uh, I lost the audio from this point uh, forward on the class that I was teaching on the book of Matthew in Matthew chapter 7 about the wise and foolish builders and the lesson that Jesus revealed there. So for your sake, I'm going to go through uh, the last of the Sermon on the Mount here, the application of that section. The application Jesus is going to judge our profession is what the uh, story about the wise and foolish builder is all about. We need to hear God's word and act upon it. The foolish hear and don't act. They have no foundation for their confession that they are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. They act on their own ideas rather than digging deep and laying a foundation upon what, God, uh, what Jesus taught them. And they profess uh, to know Jesus and to be his disciple, and yet they don't obey what he says. And in, as a result, they're going to be disappointed and ruined on the last day. And we don't want to be among that number. We want to pay careful attention to what Jesus taught and act on it. How have we acted on his word? Each of us needs to examine our own life we need to study and act according to what the Word of God has to teach so that we can have confidence that we've built our house on the rock. Our house is our profession, that we're Christians. It's our spiritual life, our spiritual hope, and it needs to be built on the foundation of an obedient faith. The storm that is going to come and challenge our house is the trials that we face in life that test our faith the tribulation and persecution we may have to go through, uh, the judgment day that we're going to face when we stand before the throne of Christ. Are we going to stand the test? Well, we need to hear Christ and act on his word. Dig deep and have a good firm foundation. Listen, study his teaching. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, Colossians 3.16. Have that engrafted word which is able to save your soul, plant it in your heart and abide by it. James 1 and verse 21. Do what the Lord says. His word is tested. It's our shield. It is not to be added to or taken away from lest we be proved a liar in the book of Proverbs in chapter 30 in verses 5 and 6. So Jesus Christ has given us these commandments and we show that we're his disciples when we keep his commandments and obey him. The works of obedience are what are going to prove our faith on judgment day. It's going to prove that we were faithful to the Lord and that we really had a relationship with him. It's the way that we um, act and the way that we live according to his teaching. It's a foundation for the future. The rich are instructed in 1 Timothy 6 and verses 18 and 19 to lay up for themselves a firm foundation for the future by sharing and doing good. 
performing the things the Lord told them to do. They'd have a firm foundation and be able to take hold of eternal life someday. Our obedience is our witness at Judgment Day. It's what's going to stand up with us and say, uh, along with the Spirit, that we are children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. He tells us what a Christian's to be, and our spirit should respond, that's what we're doing, that's not what we're acting like. In Hebrews 11 and verse 4, what was it that bore witness to the, the, the gift of Abel? It was um, his obedience, right? His obedience showed that he had faith. And what's going to give us a good conscience on Judgment Day and be able to be accepted by Christ is going to be the works that we do. Our obedience to his word is going to give us confidence. So we must grow in obedience and make certain about our final salvation. That's what Peter says there in 2 Peter, isn't it? We, we got to add all of those virtues, add moral excellence and knowledge and perseverance and self-control and brotherly kindness and love and all of the other qualities the Bible teaches. And then our place will be abundantly supplied on that last day. We'll never stumble but we're going to be able to enter into life. So be the wise man that builds upon the rock. Let's look at the reaction to the sermon. The sermon in uh, chapter 7 of Matthew in verses 28 and 29 has this uh, ending to it. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. When the people heard the way that Jesus taught, they were amazed. The word there in Greek means to be struck out, uh, expelled by a blow, was this literal meaning. It was to struck, be struck out of one's self-possession in a, in a metaphorical sense, to be shocked, to be struck with astonishment. When they heard how Jesus taught and addressed them, they'd never heard a teacher like that before. Uh the statement, we're amazed, is in the imperfect tense, which means it happened in the past continually, and its results remain. So they were continually astounded uh, at the way that Jesus taught, the type of authority that he taught with. When you examine Jesus' teaching, it was not like the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus' teaching was very clear and straightforward in the way that he delivered the message. It was systematic. It was ordered. It was something that uh, got to the heart of the matter. He revealed the very truth of God. It had great significance for your soul and for eternal uh, destiny was that word that Jesus taught, was weighty and eternal. He spoke, they said, and were astonished at the authority with which he spoke. The word authority means power to command, power to enforce laws and judge. Jesus spoke as God's spokesman, the ultimate spokesman of God, the ultimate prophet, and revealed to them the very words that God had delivered to him. He had power, authority when he spoke, moral, religious power, Thayer says in his Greek lexicon. That's what came across through his teaching. And it wasn't like what the people were used to hearing from their scribes. The scribes had very evasive reasoning. They argued back and forth and sometimes never really came to a firm conclusion that they agreed on. They wasted a lot of time with trivialities that they argued over in their different writings and teachings. They rambled on and on discussing uh, these points of theology and so on. They borrowed from one another and quoted one another as authorities rather than speaking with the authority of one who speaks for God. So Jesus spoke in a way that they had not ever heard before. The Sermon on the Mount and his teaching made great impacts on people. And I've talked to gospel preachers that had been converted to Christ and were converted by the Sermon on the Mount and the power, the authority with which Jesus spoke helped convince them that he was the Son of God. 
It is a passage, you know, that reminds me of the book of Jeremiah in chapter 2 and verse 13. In Jeremiah's day, people had rejected true prophecy that came from God, the true God, and had turned to idols and false prophets. And the statement was made by God, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. And if they rejected Jesus and only listened to what the scribes were teaching them, they were broken cisterns that couldn't help. Jesus was speaking the very words of God. He was a fountain of God's truth. Well, I hope this lesson in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Gospel of uh, Matthew will be a blessing to you and that you'll be back next week to see what we study in Matthew chapter 8, a chapter that speaks about the miracles of Christ. Those miracles are the ways that all of these truths were confirmed that they came from God. Till then, God bless you and be with you.